So I think there's that space between what I'm capable of right now and my capacity that very few of us fill or even notice is still empty and available to us. But I also think it's my responsibility to do enough while I'm alive that it actually matters. For some people that might be like raising great children. Anyone who can gain self-awareness over their thoughts gets to know that, oh, I'm not my thoughts. I'm actually something bigger and beyond that. Today's guest is known as the sports world's best zone coach. And she's also a holistic mental performance specialist for elite performers. What does that mean? Well, it means that she works with top tier athletes, coaches, and teams from the NCAA, WNBA, NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball. And to top it off, Shaquille O'Neal himself said our guest is a unique person with a special gift to help athletes but it's not just athletes, it's you and me as well. So please help me in welcoming to the We Do Hard Things podcast, author of the new book, Meta Athlete, Laura M. Wild. Out of everything that you could do, I'm I'm always curious when people have have so clearly dedicated their life to the pursuit of like, you know, just the most extraordinary career path. And, you know, everything that I've learned about you is that you're an absolute leader in this space. So why this out of like everything that you could have done? Why is this the thing that you're like hanging your hat on? You're like all in on. (laughs) Well, mostly because girls could not play in the NBA as players. So that's one reason I have access. So you were like super, super passionate about basketball. And that was like, damn it. I I need to be attached to this somehow. Yes. I want to be in the NBA. And then, you know, I noticed that whatever athletes do, like the rest of the world thinks it's okay. Like, oh, if athletes do that, that's cool. So I was like, oh, wait, so if athletes recognize that, like this higher connection to ourselves is cool, then maybe the rest of the world will also have, you know, a transformation. So Mm -hmm. for me, like learning that for myself and like, who can I share this with? Well, athletes, they have the biggest platform on the planet. Hmm. And so whether you're working with, um, you know, the NBA or you're working with, you know, people down on Wall Street, or I noticed that you work with like fire departments. Like, <laughs> is, there, is there a difference to how you approach these problems, these challenges, the need to be able to perform, or, or are people kind of all the same, no matter kind of what level or pressures kind of on them? I think people are different, but you know, my work is so, my work is so intuitive that it's always different. Like it's different from one player to the next, from one session to the next, an executive on Wall Street. I mean, it's funny because a lot of these, the, if I work with men especially, a lot of the men like working with me because I work with athletes and they're like me. They wanted to be in the NBA too. So, <laughs> I mean, it's it's like this highest, most incredible platform. So yeah, I think, you know, I think at some level there's this whole universal truth to people. Even the best athletes on the planet don't think they're good enough. You know, they're even insecure. Even if we can't tell from the outside, right? There's that soft shell inside every one of us. And so that's where I like to connect with, you know, to the vulnerable side of us. And that's where we're all the same. And, you know, that's, I play so much in that space, not, not by any means doing what you do, but I just, I live like I have so much anxiety and I have so much doubt and (laughs) and it's funny because, you know, like I have a really good friend who's, who says like to, you know, you are either Mark, the most confident person in the world or you are like in pieces completely hopeless <laughs> like wondering what is the point of going on uh and so when you're speaking to these when you're working with these people who who are good at hiding the fear and the doubt and everything else how do you balance facing these hard things while still and, and facing these hard times while still wanting to keep things up and positive and yeah. hopeful and optimistic mm-hmm. Uh, I think one thing is being really honest. Like, I mean, I'm probably, I feel like I'm the most insecure person. I doubt myself a lot. And I have these moments, like I spent a lot of years being depressed. So I kind of get it. And then, but the difference is I have tools and I use my tools all the time. Like I, I, you know, I live alone so I can walk around and hear myself talking to myself. And then I remind myself not to say that to myself. So with the people I'm working with, especially now, the times are interesting, right? So I remind them that we all have these moments and like, what are the tools you're going to use to get yourself out of this? Because I might not want to get out of bed one morning, but I have this huge amount of pressure. You probably feel this too. I mean, I'm just assuming 
like, oh, but people are counting on me to show them that it's going to be okay. So that motivates me more for me to find why is it going to be okay? Is it really? <laughs> you know, so I'm constantly questioning myself, constantly quest- constantly questioning, you know, what's going on. And I'm, I operate pretty well being like in a state of anxiety because I'm constantly anxious. <laughs> so luckily I can manage my, I, I probably am one of the most anxious people I know that I've ever met. And I don't say that I hide it well. Uh, I just use my tools. Are you, are you on team GAD like I am? Yes, right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I think, you know, helping others deal with anxiety by telling them that I'm anxious because they always think, oh, no, you, you know, you're just chill. Nothing bothers you. I'm like, hell no. I'm, I'm worse off than you are in the morning, but I just have to go from zero to 100 quickly because I can't hang it at 50 or a 60, you know, so I've got to get to a high level really fast. So I make really big turnarounds. Like that's my, my, uh, my skill. That's my superpower. I can go from it's, zero it's, to 100. It's boom. Turnaround. Yeah. Okay. So this is super interesting now because I didn't even know we were going to talk about this, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so I've, I have realized that I've anxiety for a very long time. I've realized that, that it's, you know, I would say maybe over the last two or three years has really started to actually hurt me. And now I'm hopefully, you know, coming to the other side, but, but I'm trying to figure out like dyslexia. Awesome. I know that people who have dyslexia often go on to do the most amazing things because they're able to compensate for it. They turn, they turn the pain into like a superpower. Um, I know that if you're, you know, if you're bipolar, then, then there's like, there's like these things that can unlock in your brain. Cause you think the way that other people don't think <laughs> Yeah. for those of us who are anxious all the time, scared, worried, uh, you know, like, like <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what's the superpower you and I have. Uh, we're really adaptable. Like okay. we are the most, some of the most adaptable creatures on earth because the levels of anxiety don't prohibit us from being great. Cause we don't let it, like we can't let it because if we did, we never would have done anything at this point. Like I literally remember being anxious in kindergarten and I think it also makes us really intuitive. And maybe the reason we're anxious is because we're intuitive. So we're feeling everyone else's little junk that's going on. But mm-hmm. I think that my adaptability is where, you know, I, I have this thing that I have up in my house that says adapt like the aphid. I forgot why it's adaptable, but there's this creature on earth that is the most adaptable creature on the planet. <laughs> I, I love that so much. I love that so much. Okay. And so, so we are adapted. You know, I think, you know, I, I am a pretty adaptable person, um, but, but you've mentioned into, you know, intuitiveness or in, intuition quite a bit. And I do know that you have a new book coming out that specifically talks about this. Um, I've heard others say that intuition is not a real thing. It's pattern recognition due to just the sheer number of hours that you have put into something. And so there, therefore you feel it in your bones or in your gut and you know it to be true, but it's simply just a developed skill. What, mm. what, what does intuition mean to you? Well, the reason I know intuition is real, like beyond anyone's ability to tell me it's not, is two, two things. One, I was in a mall in Irving, Texas. This is before shootings were, were a thing. And I said, mom, we have to leave right now. I, I had this complete crazy panic in my stomach. I said, I don't know why we have to go. I was like 21 and we didn't leave. And a guy came in within minutes and shot the mall up. So I realized later, like, why did I want to leave? And my whole family was like, why were you in, you know, insisting we leave? And the second time was I was driving in a car with no cell phone and I started sobbing uncontrollably. I was going back to college and my girlfriend said, what's wrong with you? I said, something happened to my boyfriend. She goes, what, what do you mean? We just saw him. I said, something happened. Let's go back. So I turned around, drove back 50 miles and he had been shot and killed uh, in a robbery on the way home from work. So that's not a pattern recognition because no one else had ever died or been murdered in my whole life that I knew. So, or not been murdered. So for me, those moments were like, like, how could I have known that? There's no way. And then I doubted it a little bit, but you know, years later I found myself learning intuitive healing. And so now when I feel that feeling in my gut, I, I pause and I know something's going on. And sometimes I still ignore it. You know, it's hard to trust intuition sometimes. I, I was at a restaurant and I thought, I better go back to my car. Who knows why? And my friends kind of laughed it off. Oh, stop being ridiculous. 
then we saw on the video camera that a guy broke into my car at that moment and grabbed my bag. I just gotten off a plane and took everything. <laughs> so now when I feel that feeling, whatever the next thought is, I act upon it. Whether it's driving and going, get over to the left. I hear a voice. I get over to the left and then the truck loses its trailer in front of me. You know, so these things aren't patterns. Like people who are intuitive, we know that intuition is real. And everyone actually is intuitive. We just all haven't built up the muscle. So that's what I aim to show people. It's like, you're really intuitive. We're all really connected. We can connect with each other. We can feel each other's thoughts, even if they're not spoken into the field. And that's really important that we be aware of the things we think are getting there anyway, where we're not thinking nice things about someone, they feel it. Wow, this is so interesting. So do you believe that this, this is all innate to us and we have conditioned or trained ourselves to ignore and turn off the switches and all we have to do is kind of just unlock these things or are these new skills that we need to pick up train and develop yeah well i think they're new skills now but i like to study birds and the pattern of birds and so if you study birds and you think about bird brains it's like oh yeah of course we have a gps at least as good as a bird would have <laughs> right so <laughs> I mean, at least that good, right? So I think we all have great intuitive skills, but human beings, because we're so interesting, interested in outdoing ourselves and our ancestors, we step away from intuition. And I think we're really starting to come back to that. I think people, you know, we've gotten all this great technology and now a lot of us are sick of it. We love it. We're addicted to it. We can't do without it. But the idea of unplugging is something that you know, many of us relish, like, I love the idea of unplugging computers and GPSs. Of course, I get lost if I unplug my GPS, so I have to have it on at all times now. <laughs> Even though I'm intuitive, like, um, I don't know how to get to, you know, any anything, really, actually, I can't even, I can barely find Home Depot without my GPS that's down the street. So I think it's there inside of us, like, and I, I, I can show anyone that they're intuitive. So that's why I know that we all have it, because I teach a class on it. And people will say, I'm not intuitive. And at the end of the class, they literally can tell me something about a person they've never met and all they know is their name. So intuition is real and it's, it's literally the superpower of this next decade and beyond. For, for myself, you know, I mentioned that, you know, the last few years I've just been trying to been working through things. Um, yeah. In the fall, just, just in the last few months, you know, I started working through therapy and I started um, trying to explore more about myself. And I really hit this point where I realized I could see the patterns of behavior in the past that led to outcomes that I didn't want. Mm -hmm. And so I could see it. So awesome. I'm self-aware and I could catch myself in the moment and go, okay, in the past, I would have reacted this way and I don't want that outcome. But I couldn't know I, I, I didn't know what to grab onto because now I couldn't trust my instinct. I couldn't, uh, it, my, what I would normally do would always lead to the same outcome and I don't want that outcome and I need to do something new. And now, now I have nothing to gra grasp onto. I have nothing to trust. I, I just don't yeah. know. So, so with intuition, if it comes naturally to you, Yahtzee, but, but <laughs> is this something that, that needs to be built and how do you trust, like, how do you come to trust it more? Well, I, I come to trust it because I didn't trust it and the result was bad. So kind of like you just said, I mean, you made choices that didn't work. So for me, like, oh, the last time I made the choice to ignore my intuition, this happened or the last, you know, so for me, it's, it's, that is the same thing. It's like, I'm learning the hard way that so my intuition is to be trusted more than my crazy brain, like, or my mind, like more than my, I always say, you know, you know, on some level, we're all insane. Like, the insanity of my mind, like the insanity of my mind will have me do things that my intuition would never let me do. So it is a matter of trusting it. And I really, honestly, I think trusting it because I would fall flat on my face when I didn't. And then when I do trust it, I'll even say, I'll have days like, I'm going to trust my intuition so much for the next two hours. Show me something like, you know, me and my conversations in my apartment are awesome. Like, please show me something, God, show me. And one time I did that, when I was really not trusting intuition and I literally met Malcolm Gladwell. And if I hadn't trusted my intuition, I would have gone right. And I, I felt my intuition say, turn left. And I turned left and I met my favorite author on the whole planet. Like it was amazing. And uh, I had quoted him in a book I was trying to write and he hadn't responded. So I meet the guy and then the next him, day, like, hey, I'm writing this book. Hey, can we go ahead and get that yeah. quote approved? And he remembered the email. So he wrote me back and I got I, the book got to go through. So I think that in what you said about choices, I, I love because 
for me, I can see where, oh, I did that and I thought that and then this happened. And I created this situation or problem in my life and not even on purpose sometimes, right? Like I can't, can't help it if I have lack of uh, worthiness, you know, about myself. I mean, maybe I can help it, but initially I couldn't. And now I can because I know, but sometimes it's easier to pretend and you know, ignore that stuff and act like I don't have those issues. Right. So I feel that we can make a choice of trust. Who coaches the coach? Yeah, I mean, like, like how do, how do you yeah. find, because I look at your career and I look at the work you do and then now hearing, um, you know, the, the similarities in terms of like, you know, I'll have more, I'll have moments where I'm very, very confident that, that I know that I can help this person and I know what the answer is and I know what to say. And then I have these long moments, like, like, sorry, these long months, let's say, where I just don't put out confidence. I don't put out content and I don't, I can't bring myself to write anything. I can't bring myself to do anything because, because who am I to have the answers, right? Like, so, yeah. so, you know, with you working through this and writing so many books and, and leading, you know, an entire movement this way, where does that confidence come from and, and who coaches the coach when you're not sure if you can believe in yourself? Yeah. One thing is I think my past self coaches me and I even let my future self coach me. Like I have lots of conversations with me in two years or three years, just using some of the intuitive skills, not being too weird, but it, it's a little weird, but it, it helps and it's, it, it works. Um, so the things I write down in the moment of feeling great and confident, I write myself notes, letters, little things around the house. So later when I'm feeling like, like you said, like, who am I to think I could do this? I can read that. But I also think that I really surrender to like a greater power, like a greater power than I. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's information that I get sometimes, like, how would I know that? Well, and I can stop breathing and guess what? I'll start breathing again. I can literally pause my breath and try not to breathe a little bit, but I will breathe. So that's my coach. Like who, where did that breath come from? I don't know, but that, that thing is more intelligent than I am. So let me surrender to that higher level of intelligence and just let myself really trust that everything I'm doing is in divine timing, whether it's a failure or a huge loss. Like I really have begun to trust and the inner, you know, that inner voice that I hear is, is also coaching me. There's like, there's like five voices, right? Like, nah, 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 that voice. And then there's the negativity, but then there's the like really profound sense that I'm meant to be here and that I'm meant to do great things. I mean, you know, my ancestors did not, you know, lie on in bunks on slave ships for me to be mediocre. So I feel like there are generations of human beings who sacrifice so much for me to be here that I can't let them down and I can't let myself down, you know? So trusting myself was what I really found first, even like trusting myself that when I say I'm going to wake up at five 30 and meditate that I do that. That's the first step in trusting myself, doing what I say I'm going to do. And then, Oh yeah, I got up at five 30 and I meditated. I'm trustworthy. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I ate really healthily for, four years straight, I can trust me. And so trusting me is where I can recognize that, that I am capable of going beyond because I could just put the plan in place and then surrender. Like I always say, if you know all the steps to your goals, the, like tear that up that is no way worthy of you. Like I need to have a step, like my goals have to have some steps where I'm like, I have no idea what you got, you know? So I need to have some divine intervention for my goals. So, so you met. said goals where you know a first few steps but you allow kind of just like majesty or the universe or whatever yeah. you want to call it you, you expect that that to take place to pull you in a new direction yeah i mean i expect miracles and uh one of the things I, there's, there's a quote i heard i'm not even sure who said it but uh, my son brought it to me he said mom one thing about your work that's so important is that you allow, allow people to leave room for the unimaginable so i want to leave room for the unimaginable because I know that any goal I set with my little tiny mind, with that little insanity piece, like of just me being human, is not big enough. So if I set a goal with my mind, all it is is based on my experiences and someone else's experiences. It's based on what human beings think we can do, which we can do great things, but we tend to limit ourselves. So I love my goals and my intentions to be based on what, you know, like you said, what source allows me to do, not what I think. 
Cause that's just small. Like I know I, even though I don't feel like I think small, I know on some level I do. Cause I can look back at old me and go, she was thinking so small. Like, what was she thinking? You know, even though she wrote cool things for herself, she was still thinking small and limiting herself. <laughs> so do you feel with all of the people you worked with, do you feel that anyone lives, feels like they live up to their potential? I feel like a lot of people think they live up to their potential, but I don't think anyone does live up to their potential because oh, interesting. I, so you yeah. think, you think, especially with the professional athletes, you think that they're, they, they feel like they're achieving their potential and they're maxing out, but they're nowhere close. Yes. I would, I would think that most people index <laughs> the other way, which is this constant feeling of never living up to their potential mm -hmm. and constant questioning of, of how do I, how do I get there? Yeah. I think, I think there's a level of satisfaction that helps us sleep at night where we go, okay, I average a double, double. Now I can sleep at night. This was my goal. And for me, I think, well, that was your perceived potential. That was what you thought you're capable of doing, but you had this whole capacity to average a triple double or whatever it is. So all you did was reach the potential of your current capability, but your capacity is so much beyond what you've imagined, what you've thought, what you've, planned. And so I think we had this actual potential that is largely untapped in human beings across the planet. And so I think there's that space between what I'm capable of right now and my capacity that very few of us fill or even notice is still empty and available to us. Ooh, that just gave me anxiety right there. I can feel, I can feel that in my chest going like, I'm nowhere near my potential. I already know it. My capacity is so massive. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and so when you're, when you're working with, you know, I'm going to generalize here. So you're working yeah. with people who I would say are competitive, um, goal oriented, uh, achievers. And when you're dealing with those types of people and correct me if, 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 it, if there's other types of people out there, and then you go out to the, the real world, um, there's lots of us who aren't that competitive, who aren't that goal oriented, who set, you know, on Monday morning, I say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna hit the gym five times this week. And then the week goes on and you hit it three or four times or whatever it is. It's just, it's just, we just don't have the $40 million contract in our mind on the line. And so, you know, we, we, the reason people love athletes is we put them off in this kind of superhero category or something. Yeah. But but deep down, are they, I guess what I'm asking is, can we learn to be as competitive as them? Can we learn to be as goal oriented as them? Can we learn to want it as much as they wanted without, you know, us getting distracted or letting goals go or whatever it is, or are they just like us and they just hide it better? <laughs> um, yeah, the latter. <laughs> I think that the people who are doing some of the greatest things are just like us and they hide it better. Plus they have better coaches. Like I'd work out every day too. If I had a strength and conditioning coach waiting for me at 9.00 AM. And if I didn't go, I was in trouble. Like they have things in place. And I feel like that's, I feel like they had a, at some moment in time, someone saw whether it's their divine spark, they saw like that's greatness or they saw a level of talent. And then there was the support system that was built around that. So now it's harder to fail. I mean, you still have to show up and you have to have that internal thing, but there's this, you know, whole group of people. And I feel like athletes feel a lot of pressure. Like these, these pro guys feel so much pressure and not just from their immediate family, but their surrounding family, their towns. So they're playing on the big stage and it requires something inside that I think not everyone has tapped into, right? Everyone has, but not everyone has tapped into that ability to be great or to keep going or to be competitive or to want something bigger. So I think we all have the potential for that. You know, you know me, <laughs> we all have the potential to want to be great. And, yeah. you know, it's just, we, however we grew up or whatever our environment was had a lot to do with it, but also like our DNA has a lot to do with it. You know, if our DNA, if we have, like I've met, you know, I have women that I work on and do healing work with, if they had an abused mother and grandmother, it really significantly changes their health and their whole ability to live or strive or thrive. Like all they want to do is survive and they don't even do that well sometimes. So I think, you know, who our people are, who our ancestors are has a lot to do with it and the traumas they suffered or the conditions they suffered through can help make us, you know, resilient or 
hide from the chance to be resilient and, and great. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting. I, I, um, you know, my dad, on my dad's side, we don't, we don't know any family history. My, my grandfather on my dad's side died when he was very young. Uh, he grew up in Germany during kind of World War II. It's hard to figure out any kind of history or anything. And so I was speaking with my therapist about um, family of origin and all of this stuff. And I kept saying, like, I only know a little bit about one side of my family and I don't know anything on the other side of the family. And so to me, it's always this black. And he's like, oh, you don't have to worry about that. But to me, I'm like, well, it's this. Yeah. Like, I mean, like there's, there's stuff ingrained into us Yeah, and there's stuff that I'm seeing in my kids reflected back. So clearly yeah. it's, it's coming from, coming from somewhere. And yeah. So, um, and so you like, you, you, how do you help people, I guess, when they're coming to you, Right. Pro, uh, professional, uh, business person, someone working through a hard time. Where's the place to start? Well, I mean, some of my training is in a really fascinating new field called epigenetics energy medicine. So the cool thing about epigenetics energy medicine is that it's based on intuition. And people have verified this. Like, I'll say, oh, your grandmother had asthma. Well, I don't know. Well, talk to your mom and see, oh my gosh, grandma had asthma. So, you know, Mark, I mean, this might get you excited, but you don't have to know anything. You can just find an intuitive practitioner to help unlock what's there. So for me, like people, helping people de-identify, like I, I like to say that de-identify with their thoughts as being them is a great place to start. But we also have to remember like our- What does our, that mean? Sorry, de-identify like, their own with, thoughts as their own? Yeah, well, because we like- if I didn't meditate, I would think that my thoughts were me. And I would think that the voice in my head was my voice instead of recognizing that that's just like a frequency I'm stuck on. Right. So I want to help people understand that they're, if they're not, you know, thriving, they're probably just stuck on a frequency of low vibrational thoughts. So if we go, Oh, that's not me. I'm going to shift my vibration. I'm going to go a little higher and be a little closer to joy and peace as opposed to apathy and grief or anger. So de-identifying themselves as their thoughts, like you're not your thoughts. You're actually this beautiful, you know, soul on the planet and you turn into a frequency based on your environment or something, something that's happened in your life could have taken you there. You know, if someone suffers from a lot of trauma, they're probably going to have these thoughts that go right along with that story. So I help them step outside of that as their identity so they can actually start to grow beyond who they thought they were. And a lot of that has to do with like mind, body medicine. So, you know, if I have, because when I work with players, especially athletes, mental performance can't just be about the mind and the thoughts. I like it to be about mind body connection, because if my thoughts are negative and I can't make free throws, it's no, no amount of talk is going to completely change that. However, if I can help that athlete by, you know, doing some intuitive epigenetics, energy medicine, like out there, fun stuff and say, Oh, you know what? You're, you know, six generations back you know, your relatives were really in a lot of PTSD. So as soon as you get to the floor to shoot a free throw, mm -hmm. that's reactivated. So let's work on the epigenetic markers in the kidneys. So we've got to let the fear that maybe gets stuck in the kidneys, this is kind of based on Chinese medicine too. If we have fear and it's hanging out in our kidneys, no matter how much we tell ourselves that this is not going to affect us and the next time we get to the free throw line, it will. Because we can't control that subconscious mind unless we have some more awareness about it. So to me, like the awareness is the gift. And that's where I think for what you're saying about your therapy and stuff, you have this great level of self-awareness you're, you're coming into and that you're, you know, really moving through. And that self-awareness, I think is like, that's key. Like anyone who can gain self-awareness over their thoughts gets to know that, oh, I'm not my thoughts. I'm actually something bigger and beyond that. And so that's that top down stuff, right? Top down mental performance, top down mental resilience can't start just with thoughts. It has to go beyond it's like recognizing that we're outside of that, that there's something about us that truly is infinite and that we have to find that space first before we can really clear away what the body's hanging on to or all the old, all the fear that we've gathered through our lives that we like to, you know, look upon to, to identify what we should do today. Like, let's let go of that stuff and go beyond that. Hmm. That is super interesting. And so I heard you mention that you play with time. I play with time a lot. You know, the idea of, <laughs> yes. I, I get very sentimental about the past. I'm I live my whole life in the future, basically. It was very easy for me. I started my, my company in 23. 
Um, it was very easy for me to become an entrepreneur at 23 with because I didn't have any money because I'm willing to sacrifice for years because the future <laughs> will be get better. Yeah. I only get depressed when I realize the future is never coming. <laughs> so like, it's like, oh, it'll be better. It'll be better. And then after years and years and years, and you're like, oh, it's still not better yet. I get a little bit depressed. But I heard you say you play with time, which I think is super cool. Um, I've started playing with personas or just this idea for myself of like, who do I need to be? Right. Yeah. It's not who I am. It's not who I was. It's not who I want. It's just if I want this thing, if I want this goal, if I if I need to achieve this thing in my mind, then what type of person do I need to be in order to be able to pull that off? Yeah. Do you play with anything like that? And if so, how does that <laughs> how does that come into the idea of, of intuition? Because to me, it would actually seem very counter. It would be very different than intuition. It's like I'm I'm now putting on a, a suit of someone who's who's strong and I'm going to do strong things because I'm strong as opposed to my intuition might say, Hey, um, go chill out on the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not your intuition talking. <laughs> Unless something else is happening. Well, okay. So the magic, like you said, the strong suit. So I, I like to remind people that intuition is like getting into the alpha zone. Like when you're in the alpha zone, you're really intuitive. So my goal is to live every day in the alpha zone. Like if I can live most of my moments of each day in the alpha state, which is just a more relaxed brain state, I'll be even more intuitive. So one thing I do play with that I think athletes love is I'll have them pick a couple of athletes they really admire. And then I have them imagine merging with that athlete. It really works well if you take someone to the alpha zone and then they merge with the athlete. They just imagine like stepping into this person's body. And there was an athlete I worked with a couple of years ago and he said, well, Kobe Bryant is a pro player, a pro athlete, right? He said, Kobe Bryant is a player that I love the most. I said, well, let's just play with the idea of how great Kobe is. And what are the things he did that you loved? He's like, he was just so steel when it came to his mind was of steel. He could do whatever he needed to do, but he was like in the flow state. So this athlete proceeded to score, to make five three-pointers in a quarter. It was not the best guy on the team. He wasn't even considered, you know, a big help in general. So he hit five three-pointers and like, you know, it was like a team record. So he's like, whoa, all I did was I just really got connected in the alpha zone to like the Kobe energy, the Kobe blueprint. It doesn't matter at like this point, you know, this was when Kobe was still alive. It doesn't matter if someone's alive or dead because there's an energy blueprint that they created and formulated. But none of this, like, our, like my talent doesn't come from me, right? My, my talent comes from beyond me. If it's really truly my highest level of talent. And Kobe knew that, like he taps in to this allowance of this greatness to move through him. And he certainly cultivated it, but like he had this gift that he cultivated. And so we can all access like someone else's greatness just in energy form. So like, to me, that's, that's really intuitive to do that. Why not do that? Because I don't want to just get what I practiced. I want to actually tune, like, get what I practiced and what this person practiced and what they did and what they did and what they did. So I want to build this you know, an incredible wealth of knowledge and skills and tools based on the work of others without taking away anything from them. Just, it's almost like I'm going to get in that lane. Let me go get in the Michael Jordan lane. And then I'm going to switch lanes for a second to the Steph Curry lane. Mm -hmm. And both of those lanes have great things for me just to kind of pull that into me. And if I do that from the alpha state, it's really powerful. It's, it is, it's like playing with energy. Basically. I love to play with energy. I love to play with time and it, you know, people will, you know, some scientists won't understand it, but others realize that time and space barely exist. If they don't exist, then of course I can play with the energy of some other athlete or some other great speaker or something like that. Right. Mm. Does, does this cost, like, I, I always think in terms of, um, I, I have a habit of breaking everything down into risk profiles and, and so it's like, well, what's like the when you're anxious? <laughs> yeah, risk profiles and, and cost benefit analysis and stuff. And so <laughs> I was talking to a friend a few weeks ago and and I just mentioned it in passing. He's just like, oh, I'm thinking about doing this and this. And I was like, well, what's the cost? And he said, oh, it doesn't cost me anything. And I was like, no, no, it doesn't cost you any money. But 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 everything like if you're focusing on this, you're not focusing on this or just like everything comes. Everything costs something. Right. Yeah. Like there's, there's an investment or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you know, you talk about scientists or, or people who are like, well, you know, I imagine them just being like, oh, that's all hoo or whatever. But yeah, but but if something if you can tap into something and it works, 
and it helps you, it helps you perform, it helps you learn, it helps you achieve. Is there, is there a cost to this? Is there, is there an unintended consequence? Is there something that we should <laughs> say be worried about in doing this stuff? <laughs> well, as long as your intentions are good. I mean, for me, no, there's not. I mean, I, I guess some people could get really intuitive and then, you know, not use it for good. But there, the cost is the time it took for training, but I feel like I get it back tenfold. So I'm not taking away from anyone else in the universe. I'm not, you know, dissolving anyone else's skills. Like for me, I have, you know, I, I train other people to do healing work and they'll say, I tapped into you. I hope you don't mind. I go, of course not. Like what greater gift than for me to be able to be in one place doing my good work and have someone else accessing, you know, the energy that I emit. And then them doing great things too, or them helping humanity, or I, you know, I don't like to just say humanity because there are more beings on this planet than just humans. But if someone else can use what I know and my wisdom to help someone else, then that lets me say that, wow, maybe I can live a legacy. Maybe I will outlive this one body on earth. Maybe what I do will last after I'm gone. I mean, it's so hard to make enough of a difference to not be gone when you die. You know, I mean, it's, it's hardly anyone does it that that, you know, I have to w really work hard not to fall into the state of like being like none of this really matters, you know, and, and for me, because I do play with time, I think of, you know, if I hear a story of in 1955, this person had this most remarkable thing and it was all over the newspapers and it was everywhere and it was a really big stink for months <laughs> And it's like, not only does that not matter today, um, I can't believe that in 1955 for three months, the whole world was even paying attention to this because it's like <laughs> so irrelevant. Yeah. Thing where it's just like, oh yeah, the time that we are here doing what we're doing, yeah. we're not only one of 7 billion or whatever it is. Right. Uh, but, and not only is life short, yeah. but, but even the, the biggest impacts you can make disappear so quickly. And yeah. so that, uh, actually makes me fall more into complacency or more like, well, what's the point of trying or this or that? So yeah. I don't know if you fall into that, but how do, you, <laughs> how do you move back to like, no, you know what? We can do amazing things while we're yeah. doing extraordinary things. We could fight the mediocrity that everyone else puts up with. We can create and turn ourselves into the, the type of person that, that God or whomever has, has intended us to be yeah. like, I want to live over there all the time. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. I, I, fight the other way. I, I think, I mean, it's funny because um, you talk about how we like in 1955 for three months, the world looked at this. So I, my, one of my goals, I don't know who else shares this goal with me, but you know, you might add this to your goal list. I think it's a really good one is that one day that either my child or grandchild or great grandchild will be on Google and I'll be the Googled person of the day. <laughs> oh, I like that. So, I mean, and so that, so when I look at the Google person of the day, they may not be super famous, but there's a contribution that they made. So for me, it's like, well, if I make a contribution of some sort, then that's important. Like when I think about athletes, it's like, like, look how it, it you know, kids these days, kids these days, you talk about athletes. And even though they know who Larry Bird is, sometimes I'm surprised to find that they maybe have seen one little highlight. Like I don't know. Is Larry Bird a golfer? Is he a golfer? <laughs> right. They don't know. Like one of the greatest Boston Celtics of all times. Boston all time. Celtics. Oh, so he's yeah, a yeah. basketball player. Boston Celtic of all time. Like one of the most, probably the most famous Boston Celtic of all time. And okay. kids these days don't know who that person is, even athletes. So I'll tell athletes, uh, like I'll tell 22 year old rookies about athletes who played when I was young and they don't always know. So I, my son's a ballet dancer in Russia. So, I mean, I'm like, you know, I'm just, you know, he might agree with this. I'm the perfect mom to create a great athlete. Right. So I told him he had to learn all about all the greats. So this kid spent hours on YouTube studying all the greats. He knew all the, mm -hmm. the, the pieces that they had done, the names of all of them and their habits and things. I think that's part of why it made him great because he recognized like how insignificant people are now, unless you find them on YouTube. So he's like, how do I make sure that I add something to the world of professional ballet? And I, is, that, I, is that healthy for us to, I mean, <laughs> like, like 
the, the wanting to be the wanting to be the person that Google, you know, I mean, like, like I was told a lot during my teenage years in my twenties, it's just like, you know, overly confident, overly brash, uh, way too, way too direct wow. and this and that. So I've like, I I've had to spend, I spent 10 years kind of like going the other way and, and, and trying not to come away that way. So I always quickly judge my own things in my mind of like, Oh, that's just ego or, Oh, that's just hollow. Um, I know people who have more can do more. And that includes profile that includes um, money that includes uh, uh, success. But, but how do we not just, how do we know, how do we know or trust or believe that that intuition and that thing that we want is healthy and good and, and not pulling us off course? I mean, I don't even know if it's healthy to be alive, like to be alive. So, <laughs> <laughs> life itself is this crazy wild journey in a game. And I've noticed that more this year than ever before. But, but I also think it's my responsibility to do enough while I'm alive that it actually matters. And even if that's for some people that might be like raising great children. So I'm not saying we have to, you know, go on podcasts or be on TV or work in this limelight area. But I just, for me, like, and I only had, you know, I have one kid. I purposely, I, I wanted five kids. I thought, you know, if I have one kid, I can help an extra million. If I have five kids, I'll help five. So by having one kid, I can help a million other kids because I have the time, right? Yeah. To, to be doing things besides, you know, only being a mom, which I shouldn't say only because being a mom is like my greatest part of my life, right? So I don't think it's, I mean, I think it, it could be ego. Some people use it as ego. For me, it's a level of humility, like, wow, it's my responsibility to do something that helps all beings because I know that's possible because I feel that I'm, like you said, I have more, so I have to do more. I have more awareness then, and I have more understanding of, wow, what it really takes to make a difference on the planet while I'm here. So it's my responsibility to do it. Um, is it ego? I don't think so. I don't need to be famous. And some, I know enough famous people to know that being famous is something I want. I like to sit at a restaurant and just eat my food. You know, yeah. I don't want to have people staring at me or looking at me or waiting for the perfect moment to dip in and get my autograph. So I like the idea of just helping other people be better at being famous and be more um, impactful with their fame and their fortune. So for me, it's, I want people, I, I want to be the wings on which people jump off to be their greatness. You know, for, so my greatness is meant to be quiet and meaningful and hopefully profound, but it's not meant to be something that's famous that I'm famous for. I, I know that I have enough people that I work with who are famous and who are in the limelight and spotlight, not the limelight, in the spotlight. So those people rely on me to make sure they can encapsulate themselves enough to cultivate that greatness and then share it with the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm just helping them be better. And by helping them be better, that's how I can leave a legacy. You know, I, I have, um, I, I have my wife and I've been together a long time. I have two daughters. 14 and six, and I have two sons as well. I've got four kids, but, but mostly I'm thinking of, of, you know, as a father, um, you know, I, I grew up in a free country as a kind of an upper middle-class white guy. So, so, you know, like as much as free like, and white, you know, I'm like, Oh, life is so hard. Not, not really. Um, you know, but, but what I'm learning, of course, first of all, I think diversity of experience, diversity of background, diversity is just the way to go for everything because you can just learn so much from other people's experiences but you know in terms of your career path in terms of growing up um, you mentioned you know being a woman and wanting to be in the NBA and there is you know there's no path to yeah. to hitting that so I can just imagine you know if I was creating the story of your life and making it up all of the the challenges the extra work you had to put in the 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 um, cultural norms that you are breaking out of and this and that did you face that and find that or am I actually just now stereotyping because I'm imagining <laughs> as you know a mixed race woman in maybe you know in America that that this is your experiences yeah well uh, when I was looking at my resume last night and I thought you are so insecure <laughs> because I'm looking at all these certif certifications and you know, schools I've gone to and education I'm working toward. 
And it's like, when will it ever be enough? So I, I think that is partly put upon me by society because people say, and I'm like, I'm stereotyping too, right? Like they'll say, you know, if you're a black person, you have to be 10 times more educated. I think it's possibly true based on people that are like hired, you know, above me or side by side where it's like, wow, I'm so much more qualified on paper than this person and maybe even in person. And if I didn't have all these qualifications, I wouldn't be in the door. I wouldn't be in the conversation. So I think as a mixed race person growing up, I mean, I didn't love that until I was 15 and Lisa Bonet took the TV screen and being biracial was cool and it was hot because before that I was the only biracial person I knew until I was um, 16, actually 17 years old, oddly enough, because there was, I was at a high school with 2,300 people and a freshman girl who was biracial showed up my senior year and she was a freshman. So the, that was the first person I knew in person who was biracial. So I definitely kind of struggle with it. My mom is so open to people of all races. She doesn't really see color. Um, that's a rare skill. Most people do see color. My mom truly doesn't. I had a psychic tell me that. My mom would tell me she didn't see color. And a psychic said, your mom doesn't see color. I was like, okay, okay. I, I, I kind of figured that was possibly true. So, it, and I grew up in a family where I was, you know, the only child of color. Although it's funny, my brother's half Italian and he's makes fun of me. He's like, I, you're not black. I'm black. I'm darker than you. I have thicker eyebrows and like, you know, I could dance better than you. So it's always been this kind of joke that how, why am I black? Am I black because I decided that I'm biracial or is it because I go visit this other family when I was a kid and hung out with my black family in the South side of Chicago, who was my black family is like super bougie too. So it's interesting because sometimes I have to look at the <laughs> idea, right? Like, am I really black? When my hair is straight, am I? When I wear a mask, dude, this has been the weirdest thing for me. I have so much white privilege with my mask on because my most of my features that make me like look African-American are from the nose down. So when I wear a mask, I, it took me a couple of weeks to figure it out. Something was weird. I was like, so, why am I so different with this mask that I'm wearing? And then one of my friends saw me in the store. She's like, I didn't know who you were. I thought you were a white lady. I'm like, what? You know, because wow. I am really high yellow skin, but I pride myself on being like super soul sister, right? <laughs> so I, I don't know if I made it up that there was that there were barriers to me, right? Like, did I make I might have made a lot of it up, but also, you know, it's it's hard to not buy into the stereotypes and the media, what people say about you. And I was actually one of those, I mean, not I'm not bragging, I'm just saying. I was in a gifted program starting in first grade for gifted children. So my high, my little schools in the suburbs of Chicago didn't think of me as less smart because I was biracial or black. So where did that come from? Honestly, the media. By the time I could start watching TV and paying attention, like NWA was coming out when I was in high school. And I was like, oh, what does it mean to be black? It means you're oppressed. And so I think I kind of, you know, glommed onto that almost like, well, how could I make sure that I'm black too? It's like, well, black people suffer. Okay, so maybe I'm suffering. Yeah. You know, it's been a, a big self exploration for me being biracial. Like, what does that mean? Does it mean anything? It shouldn't, but it does, right? Uh, my son's brown skinned. So, with all the stuff going on, like, I literally said, dude, just stay in Russia for a while. Like, don't come back here. You know, you're safer in Russia. The police are really skilled, like, at, at like getting people out of cars and getting them on the ground because it's like, it's like, mafia level policing there right so i thought you know i don't want my son to ever become a casualty of this and you know so i it's interesting because i feel like he's safer in russia these days because of all that's going on in the u.s um so it's been interesting for me to notice that a lot of me being black comes through being a mom of a black son oh it's so interesting you know like i'm i'm up here you know in a suburb of toronto up in canada and so it's just like you know <laughs> we, we kind of we kind of watch from you know we watch with interest because you're our neighbors yep. in the south but but uh you know 80 percent almost exactly like americans but that 20 percent makes a really big difference it seems you know uh and, and so yep. just shifting gears a little bit with the few minutes we have left uh if you're and i you seem very very open and transparent <laughs> I'm open. You know, we call this the We Do Hard Things podcast because, uh, because as you know, we, we learn the most about ourselves and about life and about what we're capable of when we're facing 
or working through those hard things, you know, people will look back on 2020 and say, thank you. They may not be willing to do that right now, but they will be look back on it and realize that there were blessings in there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, so for yourself, the things that you faced, your life, your breakthroughs, where, where was your greatest breakthrough and and what were the situation? What was the circumstances around Mm -hmm. that? Well, uh, there was a night when, or a day when I had made a choice, took a risk financially that didn't pan out so well. So I found myself having to sleep in my car and put all my belongings in storage. And so that first night I, I was like, dude, I could try to go sleep on someone's couch, but I'm going to fix this. So deciding to sleep in my car that first night uh, was a, an interesting decision because I had to kind of come to the realization that I think I'm homeless right now. I don't know what that means that I'm homeless. So I'm going to sleep think, in my car. I think I'm homeless right <laughs> I now. I think I'm homeless because I don't have uh, the rent money because I took a risk on my business and I don't have this. And so uh, I'm going to use the well, shower sorry, in the so, gym. So you know, what, what happened? Like, so you, so you, oh. you, you had some money, you, you yeah. was like last ditch effort. You took a risk. It didn't, it didn't yeah. pan out. That was 2011. Yeah. Last, so I, I was like, all right, great. I got this tax return coming. I always overpay taxes because to me it was like, all right. That then you know I, I at least I know in January because I was I struggled a lot because I took I spent a lot of time on my entrepreneurial career while I was also working jobs so I I constantly was stressed about money so I took a chance and then when, when the tax return didn't show up I was like oh yeah my student loans like they want my tax return I don't get it until my loans are paid off so my student loan company took the tax return so then a few grand that I was expecting didn't show up. So, cause I had really overpaid on my taxes. So suddenly I find myself faced with, wow, what am I going to do here? So I actually stayed in Los Angeles for a while as a homeless woman living in my car, because I knew if I went back to my parents, my hustle game would immediately end. They were back in Michigan and I didn't have the connections I needed to really create what I was trying to create. So, um, and I, you know, I don't know that living with my parents at that point in time would have helped me grow. But dude, I tell you, living in my car helped me grow a lot. Like I learned a lot living in my car. And also what I learned that my biggest lesson was like, sleeping in my car off and on for months, you know, taking a shower at the gym, you know, not really telling anyone, like I wasn't vulnerable at all in 2011. Like, no, I'm, you know, I'm this and I'm that. I had all these ideas about who I was supposed to be. And they were not sleeping in a car, but I actually had a nice car, you know, I had a nice apartment. Everything was great. So I would say, mom, I'm going to Ben's now. We would laugh because I lived in, I slept in Mercedes Benz and I could sleep in nice neighborhoods. No one ever bothered me, you know, and I had dark windows and my legs got a little bit crampy because I have long legs and it was a convertible. So the the back seat wasn't so great. Front seat wasn't really safe because people could see me. So, but I learned how to be happy when I was homeless and didn't have a lot of money. How did you find happiness in, like in... (laughs) Like 2011 is not that long ago. I mean, I know it's, you know, it's really not ago now, but, but <laughs> yeah. I go like, you know, where did the, where did the happiness come yeah. from? Where yeah. did, where did yeah. that come from? It wasn't long ago at all. I still drive past the, the streets where I remember I parked there. I parked there. Like it, it's vividly in my mind, even though my memory isn't always great. Those spots where I parked are, are really solid. So I think the happiness came from thinking, oh, the next thing that I get will make me happy. That's not true. So I, when someone says like, I'm a billionaire, but I'm not happy. I understand. I'm not a billionaire. And I understand why they say that. Although I'm like, well, dude, if I was a billionaire, I'd find a billion ways to be happy, you know? So the happiness came from recognizing that I, that my material world did not create joy or inner joy or inner peace. And the ability to buy something didn't make me happy. It was really the internal ticking that I had to get in place that was so strong. I had to find, make that a place that was so strong that it was always there. You know? So to me, happiness was like, Oh wow, I can wake up and do what I want. So happiness was a little bit of freedom. So I used to work from home and I was uh, doing healing sessions. So when I lost my apartment, I could no longer do that. So I find myself, found myself with this abundance of time. And so I ended up going to get a job at a juice bar, which is, you know, like, tw- I think it was like 12 bucks an hour back then. So I went from being, you know, making enough to pay all the bills and getting by to 12 bucks an hour. And this is, I had a degree, like, I mean, I'm educated. I have qualifications and I could be making a lot more, but I actually chose to stay in that space until I learned what I had to learn. 
Um, and so I didn't just go run up and try to move in with mom and dad and get a job because I knew there was something bigger that it was trying to come from me. And I felt that. And the happiness was trusting. Like I really thought, okay, I could just trust the universe. And that's where I became happy. I'm okay. I'll have food tomorrow. Will I? I don't know. And something would happen. You know, someone would call me or a stranger would show up and I'd be gifted something. So I just learned that I could trust the universe because I had never trusted and I'd never felt safe until I got homeless. And then I realized I was really safe in this world and that my soul was always safe. And that's why I'm happy because I have complete trust and faith in that. That was a fun interview. Okay, three key takeaways for me. Number one, everyone feels it. Even the best athletes on the planet, we all just don't think we're good enough. It's universal. Number two, there's a space between what you think you're capable of and what you are actually capable of. So it's your job to keep pushing to fill in that gap. And number three, of course, we all know what happiness doesn't come from material things. But here's the thing. We have this internal ticking. We have to build a drive that's so strong that it'll carry us through the hard times. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world, we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen, but you have to think big. You've gotta be bold and you must say yes. If you need more inspiration, you've got to hear from the mom turned 18 times Iron Man in Eco Challenge Fiji competitor, Sonia Wick. Click on the link right over there. That continued to light me up for a lot of years as I ran around trying to get that done. And then I didn't win, I got second, but it felt like I won because second's really close to first. 